Almost every year, the FBI reports a 10% increase in sexual assaults in large American cities. Some authorities believe that women's dress has much to do with the increase. I'll return in a moment with the amazing facts. Hello, this is Joe Cruz and the Amazing Facts broadcast, Facts Which Affect You. In our last broadcast, we introduced the delicate subject of modern dress and undress, and how the principle of Christian modesty has been violated and almost destroyed. I'd like to introduce today's broadcast with a most revealing statement about feminine pride. The professional woman who made this statement had been in sales and served as a newspaper fashion editor. And here's what she said. More and more American women pursue fashion's far-out follies. Kooky clothes and mad makeup are no longer confined to a screwball few. They're being sold to millions. Women have gone crazy. The fantastic world of women's fashion has grown into one of the greatest con games ever devised. Take hair, for instance. If it isn't striped, it may be spotted with gold or silver flecks dusted on like visible fallouts. Or a woman's whole head may be dipped into the dye vat. Then there are green eyelids, no longer merely a stage makeup for a spooky thriller. This fungus-like look can be seen at any PTA meeting. Eyeshadow kits and all colors of the rainbow sell at department stores, discount houses, and dime stores. Fashion is turned into a relentless campaign to encompass every American female from the cradle to the grave. The old are made to look infantile, and the young are high-pressured into the femme fatale market before they're out of diapers. Women have been so bewitched, bewildered, and brainwashed that they seem incapable of resisting the most errant nonsense. Anything wacky can be sold in the name of fashion. The tab for fuss and feathers is now close to $25 billion a year. Well, that's the end of the statement now by this newspaper fashion editor, a professional woman who knows what she's talking about. And you know, some authorities have raised the question as to whether modern dress styles have anything to do with the rising tide of sexual assaults and immorality. We have to all agree that there's been a tremendous moral decadence in society in recent years. The facts and figures concerning illegitimacy are simply staggering. The FBI statistics for the United States reveal the fact that 225 rapes are reported to police every 24 hours. And uh, when, uh, when I began this broadcast ministry in 1966, the figure was only 55 rapes per day. But now look how it's jumped up to 224. Now listen, friends, I know there are many, many factors involved in this lowering of moral standards. But I'd like to remind you of something here that could be very, very significant. During these same years in America, when things have almost reached rock bottom, there's been a radical departure from the dress fashions and customs and taboos of a few years ago. Now this will be granted by everybody who were adults when this period began. The present popular near-nude attire at the bathing beaches and the bar streets and homes and on parading drum majorettes and festival queens has been arrived at garment by garment, inch by inch. The voices of protest that were raised a few years ago have become well-nigh inaudible now. People just aren't saying anything about these things anymore, friends, not even the preachers or the religious institutions. Now, I'm sure the reason for this is that it's such a prickly issue to deal with. If anybody says a word of criticism about these styles of near nudity, somebody's sure to accuse that person of being evil-minded. The time has come when somebody should stand up and have the courage to tell the truth about this monstrous evil. While men and women are equally blameworthy, <clears throat> it's a fact that women are in a greater degree displaying the body for the sake of display and being exploited at every possible opportunity. You see, no popular festival occasion is complete without a half-naked queen chosen largely for her curvaceous figure from a, a number of equally unclothed contestants. We're living in a day when the virtue called modesty is almost a memory of yesteryear. Modesty is no longer considered necessary to the protection of virtue. What place can it find in all the present freedom and sex appeal and the free mingling of the sexes in nearly all situations of life? Scanty clothing is considered a mere matter of choice, and sex appeal is regarded as legitimate for both Christians and non-Christians. A minimum of clothing is deemed sufficient for both sinner and saint. Near-nude queens are encouraged by half-nude church, half church members. 
Who would be so blind as to say that there's no relationship between the present styles of undress and the rapidly rising incidence of sexual assault in the United States? The warden of one of the most famous prisons in America worked personally with and interviewed 170,000 prisoners in a 12-year period. And this is the statement he made after those interviews. Crimes of passion are increasing alarmingly. They will continue to increase until the principal cause of their increase is eliminated. And that cause is our present styles of dress in America, which, to say the least, is immodest. Immodest dress has a direct bearing on crime incitation. Now, that statement, friends, was made by a, a prison psychologist who interviewed 170,000 prisoners. And he certainly has it from the horse's mouth. Now, that's the opinion, I say, of a man who knows what he's talking about. Just read the daily newspaper. What's the reason for this skyrocketing of sexual assaults? Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to excuse the offenders in this case at all. But I'm saying that a return to the modesty which once characterized this country would eliminate, I believe, a very large measure of crime today. That 10% increase of sexual assaults is going to be reported again next year and the next and the next probably as long as the present trends of immodest dress and style are continued. I believe Satan himself has devised many of these fashions to corrupt the imagination of the world. As we read a moment ago, the imagination of the hearts were only evil continually back there in the world before the flood. And Jesus said, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Today we see a world filled with evil imaginations. Ancient Rome had no more brazen infatuation with sex and vulgarity than we do today. America has gone mad over the unholy attempt to glorify and glamorize sexual perversion. It assaults the eyes and ears on every side. Television, radio, music, advertising. It's all so thoroughly saturated that even worldly people are complaining about it. This generation can truly be said to worship the cult of the female body. Almost invariably... A new product introduced on the market is first advertised by some seductively clad woman. Physical impurity is the cursed sin of our day. The ungodly, unnatural obsession of our society with sex is the root of many of the social problems that we're having to meet. Satan has always worked through nakedness or suggestive dress. There's absolutely no question but what he has designed, this gradual breaking down of inhibitions, especially on the part of women. Sights and sounds which would have shocked the most carnal people a few years ago don't even cause any alarm now in the saints of God. The stage has been set. Conditions have been created which mark this as the final moment before Jesus returns to the earth again. My friends, we don't have to look very far to know exactly how God considers and, and looks on these conditions. If some of the complacent, compromising Christians of today would take a look in the Bible, they would know how God considers this matter of immodest dress. I want you to notice in the Word of God that one of the first things He did after sin came into the world was to clothe the nakedness of Adam and Eve. Oh, yes, they tried to clothe themselves, first of all, you remember, because they were ashamed and realized that they were naked. But let's read the account as it's given to us here in Genesis 3, verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now notice what the margin of the Bible says concerning those aprons. Things to gird about. That's what the margin says. Now, friends, if you want to come right down to it, I suppose we could say that this was the first example of topless dress, because this is apparently what it was. It was a kind of apron that wrapped around and covered only a part of the body. But this was not sufficient, and God did not approve it. Because in verses 20 and 21, we find God coming to them and saying, Unto Adam and also unto his wife the Lord made coats of skin and clothed them. Now we found in the same chapter 2, descriptions of the original dress that was made for Adam and Eve after they sinned. They designed for themselves certain clothes that were mere aprons, but God came along later and made coats for them, so they were completely covered over. So there, friends, you have a perfect example of what pleases the Lord. If you want to know what Satan's program is as far as clothes are concerned, go into some of the heathen lands of the world. The farther back you go into the bush country and jungles, you find people who are wearing less and less, and then finally nothing. 
After he gets control of an individual, one of the first things Satan does is to try to get him uh, to take his clothes off. Now, the proof for this is found in Luke 8, 27, concerning the poor man who had been possessed of a devil. Jesus had come to the land of the Gadarenes to visit, and the text says, When he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. Now notice this, friends, the devil had full possession of this man's faculties, and he had taken off all his clothes. Now go down to the 35th verse and read about this man after Jesus cast out the devils. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed sitting at the feet of Jesus clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Now friends, just as soon as this poor man had been delivered from the influence of evil spirits, immediately he put on his clothes again. What a tremendous example of what God would have us do in seeking to live for Him and serve Him. When the Holy Spirit dwells on an individual, He's going to be possessed of the high principles of true modesty. Now, it's true that we were created male and female, but God expects us, having become conscious of the fact, to clothe our bodies as inconspicuously as possible. If we want men to see the image of God in our faces, we'll have to keep our bodies clothed. Now, some voices have been bold enough to speak up from certain quarters about the disgraceful situation, but actually very, very few Christian voices are speaking very loudly about it today. Here's a statement from the American Quarterly of Papal Documents, a rather strange statement, but listen. The current mode of dress constitutes a serious offense against decency and and decency as a companion of modesty in whose company chastity, chastity herself is safer. The Greek Orthodox Church has spoken indirectly through its organized youth. The secular press states that an attempt was made to stage a popular bathing beauty contest in Athens, Greece, and cries of shame, shame from the Orthodox youth youth actually caused the contest to be called off. Well, the feeble, low voice of Protestantism has scarcely been heard, but there are some exceptions. If we had time, we could give those today. The Watchman Examiner has spoken emphatically on the immodesty of bathing beauty contests. And according to that magazine, one Baptist state assembly for years has enforced rules against the wearing of shorts and also against mixed bathing. So that's about it. With a very few exceptions, the issue is almost entirely untouched in religious circles. Criticism of the existing order is not wanted. And the existing order today is that of the world. So, friends, I say that it's time for our pulpits to break this unholy silence that has allowed modern undress to be adopted by a large part of the constituents of our churches. Let's hear some sermons from that text in Revelation. Blessed is he that keepeth his garment, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Let the religious press help stem this tide that's flowing against the restraints of proper dress standards. And now, this is Joe Cruz saying goodbye for today. Goodbye for today. 